Welcome back, everyone. Well, my apologies. I uh, haven't been making videos the last couple of days, but uh, I had an event for Rachel's Challenge, and right in the middle of the day, got really, really sick. Barely made it through the day. Spent almost all of yesterday in bed, except for when our basement flooded, and then I had to go deal with that and replace our sump pump and everything. So I'm barely kind of coherent today. I'm going to do a video, but it won't be a very long one. I'm definitely not feeling all that great. Still some kind of upper respiratory thing going around that I have caught. So I did want to get some content out to you. And we're going to take a look today at Simple History, their video called Strange Military Deaths. I haven't watched it, so I don't know what deaths are going to cover. Um, and then... After we watch the ones that they cover, I might add a few of my own in there as well. And then I'll invite you to do the same, to add some at the bottom. If you're new to the channel and you feel like I've deserved it after watching a few videos, please consider subscribing. And uh, there's a lot lot going on here. We've got a lot of original content as well as the reactions. I'd say these days I do about 50-50 between original content and reactions. So hope you like it. Stick around. My name's Chris. Glad you're here. Four Strange Military Deaths Although death shouldn't be entertaining, throughout history there have been some occasions where the poor soul has been so unlucky or caught in such strange circumstances, it's almost impossible to be anything other than interested. There was the owner of the Segway, who later died falling off a cliff while on one, or famous really? early 20th century dancer Isadora Duncan, who jumped in her car, got her scarf tangled in the wheels, and was strangled yep, to death I knew that the one. the driver took off. And the military is no exception. Not all who die while wearing a uniform do so in battle, or as you might expect. Some unfortunate souls have died in truly strange ways. Number 1. The Siege of Famagusta in more early modern times, military deaths could be ceremonial, unusual, or just plain gruesome. One that still stands out around 500 years later is that of Venetian captain Mark Antonio Bragadin. In 1570, the Ottomans invaded Famagusta in Cyprus as part of their goal to seize control of the Mediterranean. At the time, the island was under the control of the Venetians, and Famagusta was in the hands of strong leadership in Bragadin. However, this wasn't enough. As the force of the Ottomans bombarding the city for months on end. So this is the early days of the Ottoman Empire uh, when they're pretty strong and this is when they're really getting a, a strong hold on that area, that area between what we know today as Turkey down through kind of the Middle East, down through Israel, Palestine, that area. Uh, so this is kind of when they're really rising to power and, and asserting themselves. Meant the Venetians found themselves running low on food, ammo, and resources. Despite the citizens begging that they surrender, Bragadin refused until July 31st, 1571, when the city was dying and many of its citizens starving. The next day, he surrendered to Lala Mustafa Pasha, commander of the Ottoman army, who promised safe passage off the island to the Venetians. What happened next is unclear, but whatever did happen, Pasha changed his mind about providing safe passage for the surrendered forces, possibly in anger due to the massive loss of tens of thousands of Ottoman troops in the siege, or possibly in response to six missing Ottoman hostages that Bragadin either killed or simply did not know the whereabouts of, or even just in anger at Bragadin's continued victor's attitude. Accounts differ on this, but they do not on what happened next. In response, Pasha set about executing one of the strangest and most gruesome deaths on Captain Bragadin. Later going down in history for its brutality, Pasha ordered that Bragadin's nose and ears be cut off, and over the coming days, wounds still gaping and open, he was forced to carry earth to fill ditches, kissing the ground every time Pasha crossed his path. After 17 days of torture, according to Crowley, he was then tied to a chair and set above a ship's mast for the masses to stare and jeer, before finally being taken and literally skinned a Live, one of the most horrific execution methods in history. Finally, being flayed alive, as they call that, was not necessarily new. Um, that was actually one of the 12 disciples that are described in the Gospels, uh, one of the accounts that is out there uh, about what eventually happened to him was that he was flayed alive after being like 
crucified or something. Um, and, you know, in the 19th, 20th centuries, I know it was a real, real common in um, East Asia that they would do something called death by a thousand cuts, which is a particularly gruesome way to kill people where they just kind of keep slicing you and, and you would just go for days like this, just getting these wounds and, you know, it's horrible. You know, we are quite creative as human beings when it comes to finding interesting ways to kill our fellow man. It's pretty horrible when you think about it, uh, but we can be pretty awful. His corpse was stuffed with straw, dressed in commander robes, and paraded through the streets of Famagusta atop a cow. It was a strange and brutal death for the revered Venetian captain. Number two, nuclear accident. On January 3rd, 1961, two Army specialists, John A. Burns and Richard Leroy McKinley, alongside Navy electrician Richard C. Legg, found themselves tasked with the responsibility of restarting the SL-1 nuclear reactor in Idaho after it had been shut down for 11 days heard of for routine maintenance. All three military personnel were on active duty and only in their 20s. Both Legg and Burns had received their certification as reactor operators and and McKinley was due to pass his own the next month before things went tragically wrong. The SL-1 power plant, short for stationary low power reactor number one, was a prototype small mobile reactor at one of America's major atomic testing stations. The idea was that the tech could be developed so the army could employ it in remote areas. Unfortunately, when Burns, aged 22, went to restart the reactor, it's believed he pulled the control rod 20 inches out of the core which was tragically too far. The resulting reaction caused a wall of steam, metal, and water to rush towards the three men, killing Burns and Leg instantly, with McKinley dying approximately two hours later. It was the first nuclear reaction on U.S. soil to result in casualties, mm -hmm. and not necessarily the way you'd expect to go on duty. Number three. I don't really know what to add to that one. Uh, I had never heard of that before. I know that there have been... I don't know if that's the first nuclear reaction death on U.S. soil because I seem to recall there was somebody who died during the Manhattan Project, um, at least in the movie version that I've seen of it, where he, there was a reaction. Let me look it up. Yeah, the guy's name was uh, Louis Alexander Sloten, and he died in May of 1946 at the Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory in New Mexico. And it was uh, a test on plutonium. Uh, nuclear weapons disassembling and uh, something happened where he dropped a screwdriver and it caused this burst of radiation and there were other people in the room but he was the one who got the brunt of it and they knew right in that moment that he was basically a goner but it took him like a week or more to die uh, it was a pretty horrible agonizing death as well but um, yeah so uh, there have been deaths before that one as a result of nuclear testing and things like that Three, the Chichijima incident. Mm. Long before George H.W. Bush or George Bush Sr. was president, he was a World War II fighter pilot involved in Pacific air raids in Chichijima, a small but well-fortified Japanese island. On the 2nd of September, 1944, Bush was tasked with destroying the island's radio towers. It was 8.15 a.m. when the Japanese anti-aircraft guns hid in wait in the forest below, and the squadron of TBM Avengers nosedived over their target. Bush watched as thunderous flak greeted them with the lead planes burning up into smithereens shaking holding his breath and taking heavy fire himself he continued to fly through the dark clouds of what remained of his peers and unloaded his four 500 pounds bombs seeing his engine up in smoke he managed to parachute himself into the middle of the ocean a few miles northeast of the chichijima island but his crewmates were not as quick and perished with the japanese already sailing out to capture him he was rescued by a U.S. submarine that emerged from the ocean to take him on board. He was the lucky one. Over the decades, author James Bradley spoke to and tracked down the family and friends of Bush's naval aviator peers, as well as relatives of the Japanese commanders. Bradley uncovered transcripts of secret war crime trials that showed just how horrifically eight other American POWs of Chichijima had died. American bombers would kill more Japanese civilians than soldiers during World War II, so their fates when captured were merciless. They were beaten and tortured. Before and this here, this actually, this animation they're doing actually is based on a real photograph, I believe, of an Australian soldier 
who was executed by the Japanese while a POW. I think that's like almost an identical look at what that was. Yeah. Um, and there was a reason behind why the Japanese were so horrible to men that they captured. And it had a lot to do with how they were motivating their own soldiers so that their own soldiers wouldn't surrender because they would basically say, hey, look what we do to their prisoners. Do you think they're going to do any less to you if you get caught? Um, so, I mean, that was part of it. There's a lot more to it than that. Dan Carlin goes into this in a lot of detail in his podcast on Supernova in the East, which is fantastic and I highly recommend it. But this just goes to show you how little things can determine history, right? George H.W. Bush goes on to become director of the CIA, head of the Republican Party. He's vice president. Then he's president. His own son then becomes president. He's got another son who's a governor. and um, All of this, but he very nearly could have lost his life because he's one of the few guys that survived this. He happened to parachute into an area. There's actual video of him being rescued by that submarine. But all these other guys, I mean, he could just as easily have been one of those guys who ended up being captured and tortured by the Japanese. And I think there maybe even were some cannibals involved in all of that. For being killed, but it's what came next that was truly gruesome. As instructed by Lieutenant General Tachibana, the unprovisioned Japanese dissected and skinned alive the now dead airmen and ate their fallen enemies. Not a meal many would want to share. The truth of the cannibalism that occurred during World War II was only uncovered decades later when the sealed documents finally came to light. Mm. Number four, John Sedgwick. Sedgwick. Knew that was coming. General John Sedgwick has gained his place in history for two reasons. For being the highest ranking Union casualty of the United States Civil War. Now, uh, there's debate about that, but technically speaking, he is absolutely right. John Sedgwick was the highest ranking Union soldier to be killed in the war. Now, he was a Corps commander when he was killed in 1864 in Virginia. There were army commanders who were killed in particular um i guess there was only really one army commander killed it was um james mcpherson mcpherson killed at the battle of atlanta in july 1864 he was an army commander sedgwick was a corps commander but the way army ranking works it's based on the date of your rank and since they were both major generals of volunteers Actually, I think they both might have been major generals of regulars by this point. Whatever it was, they were the exact same rank, but Sedgwick's rank was earlier than um, McPherson's, and so Sedgwick did technically outrank him. And this would occasionally cause problems. For example, you have a guy like Ambrose Burnside who could not, he was commanding a corps and in 1864, the Ninth Corps, I think it was. He couldn't serve, the, the Ninth Corps couldn't be attached directly to the Army of the Potomac because Burnside outranked George Meade, who commanded the Army of the Potomac. And so he had to kind of serve as like this separate uh, independent force that reported directly to General Grant. It's kind of weird how that happened. And for his awkwardly ironic death on the battlefield, it was a light skirmish that took place on May 9th, 1864. In fact, the general was busy bantering with Officer Martin T. McMahon when, as he described, a sprinkle of bullets came down upon them and several officers dodged out of the way. Sedgwick himself, a well-liked general, laughed. Yeah, they called him Uncle John. He was a very beloved general. He was one of those guys that, you know, seems almost universally to be loved um and not just by the men under him but the other generals who served alongside him and teased his officers that the enemy couldn't hit an elephant at this distance what he said. which really is just asking for trouble moments later another rain of bullets forced a nearby soldier to abruptly dodge to the ground in essence throwing himself at sedgwick's feet who laughed and repeated his comment according to mcmahon he said why my man i am ashamed at you dodging that way they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance what happened next seemed almost comically timed. After the soldier's quick, quick reply, the general laughed and said, all right, my man, go to your place. Mere minutes after the second, a third sprinkle of bullets hit the party, and General Sedgwick was tragically struck under his left cheek, dying almost instantly. Je yeah, um, sometimes you'll see this portrayed as him being mid-sentence, like he, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And he gets hit. Didn't happen like that. There's actually, like they said, there's several minutes that go by. There's other things that get said. But obviously, that's what gets remembered in all of this. Because he said it within 
he said it about the very men who eventually killed him. So yeah, uh, super ironic, super sad that it happened that way, like I said, to a very popular, very competent general. Just goes to show, you should never tempt fate. Although in the military, a certain amount of death is unfortunately expected, it's very rare that you would encounter the truly strange, ironic, or just plain gruesome ways to go these poor people experience. Let's just hope there are no bullets or elephants on the horizon. All right, so let's talk about a few others that I think I would add to this list. So one that I thought of uh, is not somebody most people would have heard of. His name is Colonel James Harvey Childs. He was the commanding officer of the 4th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Uh, at the Battle of Antietam, I had an ancestor who was in the 4th PA Cavalry, and I visited the spot where this happened, because the cavalry really wasn't involved in the Battle of Antietam. There, there was no real action by large numbers of cavalry troops. Uh, they served basically in the rear, in rear positions doing you know military tasks, but not really fighting on the battlefield. And he was really the only casualty that was suffered by the 4th PA Cavalry, and one of the only casualties by cavalry at all. Uh, during the battle and here's how it was described uh, he actually took command of the brigade at that time because the brigade commander was ill and it says the brigade crossed the antietam with its troops upon the left and was posted in front of the stone bridge this is kind of the center bridge like if you're looking at a map of antietam it's the bridge it would be to the north of what we call burnside bridge where the fourth supported clark's battery and held the line upon its right a single solid shot which fell in the midst of the squadron supporting these guns, killed two men and four horses. Colonel Childs was among the killed in this battle. He had completed an inspection of the skirmish line and was with the staff under cover of a hill in a place of comparative safety. While there chatting pleasantly, he was struck by a solid shot on the right hip. The ball passed across him, throwing him from his horse and disemboweling him. He was at once carried to a better shelter when, conscious of his certain death, he first arranged his military duties, sending Captain Hughes to report to General Pleasanton and another of his aides to Lieutenant Colonel Kerr that he might take command of the brigade. He then dispatched an orderly to Dr. Marsh, telling him, if not attending to anyone whose life could be saved, to come to him as he was in great pain. He lived about 40 more minutes after sending some uh, messages to his family, things like that. So, I mean, dude is way behind the lines. There's really no danger where they are. He's having a pleasant conversation and a solid shot comes along and basically cuts him in half. It's just, you know, one of those freak things that happens on a battlefield sometimes. Here's another one that I happen to think of that we really just don't know a lot of the details about, but there was this incident known as the crucified soldier uh, in and around the battle. I think it was the second battle of Ypres. Uh, during World War One, this is just in the aftermath of the Germans' first poison gas attack on the Western Front when they released chlorine gas on the 22nd of April. This is on the 24th of April. These are when the Canadian soldiers have just arrived and started fighting and fighting really, really well uh, at Second Ypres, and uh, it became one of those real propaganda tools that was used to show how evil the Germans were. Supposedly, there was. And it says, on May 10th, 1915, the Times printed a short item entitled Torture of a Canadian Officer as coming from its Paris correspondent. According to the piece, Canadian soldiers wounded at Ypres had uh, told how one of their officers had been crucified to a wall by bayonets thrust through his hands and feet, but were having another bayonet driven through his throat and finally riddled with bullets. The soldiers said that it had been seen by the Royal Dublin Fusiliers and that they had heard the Fusiliers officers talking about it. And then there was more talk about it later on, and there's all these different kind of sources for where that came from. More recent research of this that's been done uh, have claimed that it's actually been determined it was Sergeant Harry Band. Uh, who was the crucified soldier whose body was never recovered. And so he's one of the tens of thousands of men whose names are on the Menin Gate Memorial there in Ypres, uh, the, the memorial to the missing. So uh, there's a lot of stories like that from war. Uh, the movie Passchendaele touches on that story a little bit and offers some alternative explanations for why it might have happened. But those are just a couple of interesting ones. Let me know in the comment section below if there is a particular story uh, that goes along with this theme of some real strange or unusual or freak death. 
either in wartime or in peacetime. Uh, it's kind of a macabre topic, I know, but uh, it's an interesting one to talk about. So use the comment section below. Let me know. Hopefully I'll start feeling better and we'll get back to some longer content, some uh, streams as well in the very near future. Thanks for watching.